As I wandered down the beaches on the south end of Tybee Island when I was a young feral beach rat, I used to daydream about running away from home, taking off down the Georgia coast, island hopping and foraging to survive. I've never really outgrown that daydream, though it has morphed and changed in the decades since. While sailing as a helmsman on the MV Matson Manakai in 2015, I had the idea that designing and building a boat and heading down the coast of Georgia was something I actually still wanted to do. I designed three boats for those shallow coastal waters in my head while standing watch, an expedition stand-up paddleboard, a deep V wooden powerboat, and a barge with a commercial-like front house. So of course, I didn't build any of those, not exactly. Instead, I built an outrigger sailing canoe. To be more accurate, I chopped the freeboard off a canoe and put a stand-up paddleboard deck on it, but it's still a sailing canoe, a super shallow draft canoe with a kick-up rudder and leeboard. I built a solar outboard motor and a 36 volt battery for it, several paddles, a headsail, and a mainsail. Before painting or adding non-skid to the deck, I threw Manu Iki Iki in the water here in Seattle and gave it a cursory test. My buddy Tim Devine was foolhardy enough to join me, and we tooled about in a maximum wind of 5 knots until we were both entirely bored with slack sails, and then I hauled it back out again and painted the hull. Here are some interesting things about this boat. Mano Iki Iki is built with 100% reused and reclaimed lumber. The hulls and akas, the curved sticks that attach the outrigger to the canoe, are from a cedar deck I replaced with composite decking years ago. The two bulkheads are plywood from the deck of a long since departed inflatable dinghy Tim gave me after that dinghy finally gave out. The wa'a, the athwartship members the akas lashed to, are from a piece of dunnage saved from a project I did for a Hawaiian architect, which turned out to be Sitka spruce. The rudder is from a shelf board of an unknown type of cedar ripped out of the root cellar in our house, put in by either Laura's grandfather or great-grandfather. The mast step and ama uprights are from a piece of handrail off the house I further turned with a lathe I made from a drill motor and skateboard bearings, and is clear fur. A sundry sticks used for the Spanish windlasses to tighten lashings are from a madrona tree Lara and I planted in the yard. The deck is a combination of the red and Port Orford cedars I used to make the hull and three pieces of cut off and saved Sitka spruce from a boom I made for Stu's sailboat, Ishka. The bamboo wall comes from a harvest undertaken by Andy from a neighborhood patch. He brought the 30-foot sticks over to my house, leaves and all, on an electric one-wheel through the streets of Seattle in one of the more awesome bits of randomness associated with this boat. The boat's name is Manu Iki Iki, which means really little bird, in part because one of my stellar jays hung out with me the entire time I was building the hull, hopping along the ground or in the trees and bushes surrounding the boat shed, snacking on whatever birds snack on, unannoyed in the least by the noise and the dust. The sails are from a marine garage sail Laura and I went to in 2010, which began their lives as larger sails for cruising sailboats. I have used the fabric for many projects over the years and saved remnants of fabric for just-in-case purposes. These were highly modified sail corners reimagined with Ivy's hand stitching to make up the main and small jib. There is not one piece of metal used in the construction of this boat. No screws, nails, or rigging pieces. And unlike almost all other boats, sailing canoes are male, and it is correct to refer to them as he. Once the bulk of the work was done and painted, he was ready for the trip. And then I started two large construction projects. So I put Mano Iki Iki into my storage unit, and within five minutes he was buried in, literally, 72 cubic yards of rock wool insulation. That was two years ago. Fast forward two years. I did nothing but work with very little time to recuperate, and the wear and tear was taking a toll on me. I desperately needed a break, so I set a date and an intention to take this trip. I then told everyone about that date to force myself to follow through. For months, I envisioned what I expected this trip to look like. I expected all the familiar things I grew up with. Heat, bugs, sand, thunderstorms. I expected to be underway in the doldrums of the morning's low tide and within a few short hours and before the onshore afternoon winds picked up to be at my daily destination, the next island over, setting up camp in the shade and hiding from the sun and the heat. I've always admired a large format coffee table book of photos of the Gullah Coast I grew up with and I imagined searching out the places pictured in that book and recapturing some of the images with the stunning detail of modern cameras. The drive from Seattle to Georgia was fairly uneventful. 
The first day, I made a quick hop over to Spokane and stayed with my friend Jessica and her husband Jimmy. Then after that first easy day, the driving started in earnest. In Oklahoma and Texas, I nearly was blown off the road. And in Arkansas, a torrential rain came down so hard I couldn't see the road at all. But otherwise, I did my first cross-country trip of my life, either at or below the speed limit. I arrived at my brother's place in Brunswick, Georgia in time to go out for dinner with 19 of Suzanne's belly dancing raucous friends. And the next day, I headed up to Tybee Island and moved into my friend Rusty Fleetwood's tiny house office space, adding to his boat shop the detritus of my little Micronesian canoe on the mountainous heaps and pieces of his several, several and varied types of boats. As his neighbor Bill once pointed out, wealth on Tybee is measured by the number of boats in one's yard. Therefore, I was surrounded by pure opulence. Working at Fleetwood's Boat Shop, also known as WBG Marine, is to exist inside an alternate reality. Down a dirt road, behind a gate, and at the end of a drive is a shack in the woods where I spent formative years learning how to work on boats under the tutelage of maritime historian Rusty Fleetwood. Random interruptions in the workday to salvage timbers off the beaches of Little Tybee or eat freshly harvested oysters next door at Bill's are kind of the norm. After several 14-hour days at the shop rushing to assemble, modify, and prepare Mano Iki Iki for my trip down the coast, the day to launch finally arrived. Minimal blood was required either by the gods of boats or their mosquito minions, but sadly, the sand gnats did have their pound of flesh. The day before launch, I did a second test run heading out Horsepen Creek and into the back river, Fleetwood following in his V-bottom powerboat, and everything worked as expected. My fourth and final day, I reloaded and sorted my gear and decided to leave several key things behind due to weight and bulk, including the wheeled carts for hauling the boat up the beach and the electric outboard I'd made. I loaded and launched at the noon high tide and set out for Cabbage Island, which is south of Little Tybee. The wind was a light five knots, the outgoing tide was in my favor, and everyone who watched me go by openly gawked. It's safe to say that a Micronesian sailing canoe is not a common sight around Tybee. After passing the main area of Little Tybee, I came to the mouth of Jack's Cut. The bar extends about a half mile into the Atlantic, and rounding that point I found myself in waves threatening to break. I shipped a bit of water in these waves, and because I had no tried and tested organizational theme established yet, and all of my gear was piled in the cockpit, I couldn't bail. I sailed and paddled until the threat of breaking waves receded behind me, and decided to beach Mano Iki Iki and sort out my mess and dewater. It took a bit of effort to get the waves on our stern, but once we began our run in, he maintained a true course and we beached smoothly. It didn't take very long to organize things, but as I lazily sorted and shuffled gear about, the onshore breeze picked up to a healthy 15 knots, and the waves kicked up with the wind. Heading back out into the growing surf was when everything started to go wrong. When punching through a wave on my way out through the mild surf, the typical knockback you get from heading into a wave was impeded by the rudder hitting the sand bottom, and within a second I was spun sideways to the surf. The mainsail swung around until it lay against the shroud and could swing no more. Then it filled with a healthy lungful of air, and Mano Iki Iki launched along the beach like he was fired out of a cannon. The outrigger buried in water due to the combined forces of the wind and the surf trying to roll the boat over, and I heard a loud crack. I managed to get beached again without any more mayhem, but I was suddenly feeling stuck. On one hand, the rudder worked great, but on the other, it proved itself to be a liability in the sur. As I pondered my predicament, I saw a hairline fracture in the wa'a, and that crack I'd heard made perfect sense. I'd broken a main structural element on the canoe. Discovered a pretty serious problem. A structural issue. Let's see. That crack right there. I can't tell if it's cracked next to it, but I'm going to have to do some pretty serious repair here. My choices narrowed. I wasn't leaving the beach until it was fixed. It was at that moment when I saw the mare's tails and thunderheads on the horizon. From experience, I knew I had about an hour before I'd be in a thunderstorm. 
With this bit of clarity, I sprung into action, unloading the boat and carrying my gear up into the dunes. As the sun went down and I ran back and forth between Manuiki Iki and the campsite, simultaneously setting up a hasty camp and keeping the tide from abusing my boat, the clouds moved in and the temperature dropped. As you can see, I'm racing thunderheads which are rolling in. I knew I was going to get weather tomorrow, but it's coming in early. If you look, you can totally see the mare's tails uh, broadcasting what's going on back there. Those are the thunderstorms that are coming through. So I'm racing, 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 trying to get the tent set up, racing the daylight as the sun goes down, and racing the tide to get it all put together so that I can uh, I can sleep tonight. I'm putting a, uh, a windbreak around my tent. So that's what I'm racing to do right now. I set up a windbreak to block the growing onshore breeze at the campsite, and as soon as I had everything ready and the sun was falling into the shadow of the earth and the lightning was almost overhead, the wind moved around and began howling from out of the northwest. Even though I grew up on the beach and loved the beach more than almost anywhere, I do not like sand. This change in wind direction, however, gave me all the sand I'd tried to avoid, and then some. So the windstorm last night deposited sand absolutely everywhere. It got into these vents. They just rained down the screens. Everything is covered. Fine powder of sand. Of course, <clears throat> When I open that zipper fly, all that sand's gonna pour down on my head. There's no two ways around it. It scooped out all the sand to windward and built drifts in the lee. Sand rode up between the tent and the tent's fly and poured in from the open screens above. All night the wind howled, the rain came down outside while the sand rained down inside and I shivered from cold and previous day's sun exposure and I didn't sleep. All my stuff is just buried. I wallowed out all this sand, moved it, and deposited it. Look at my apples there. Oh, what a freaking mess. As you can see, poor Manu Iki Iki was not spared the ravages of the wind and the sand. In the morning, I tore it all down again. I set up the windbreak to actual windward, northwest, not east, and then I did a half-assed job of desandifying literally every single item in my little world. So if I'm going to be stuck here for a little while, I am uh, going to make myself a little more comfortable. So I'm cleaning all the sand out of the tent now, all the sand out of all the goods, and uh, Camp Storm Dune will uh, hopefully become a little more comfortable once I get all the sand out of absolutely every nook, cranny, crack, crevice, etc. I was also rethinking my route to avoid any more breakers, running up the inside and staying clear of the beaches through the marshes, which was a bit of a downer. But at least I had lots of food. Being pinned to the beach with too much food is kind of like not being stuck at all. Sadly, every bite was seasoned with the crunchy, salty flavor of sand. All of that second day I spent on the narrow spit of sand that dangles south from Little Tybee was in a howling wind out of the north. I scoured the beach and the dunes for heavy timbers to anchor the tarp I rigged up as a windbreak for the tent. So this is what I went down the beach looking for. This will be the other side of my table. So I can make myself some fried peppers, tomatoes, and uh, other things. We'll see what I got. Uh, definitely want to fry this pepper so This is what I need for fried peppers. The further I wandered, the better the timbers I found. 
the better the timbers, the heavier they became. So I trudged up and down the beach, alternating my loads from one shoulder to the other like a modern-day Sisyphus struggling against the wind and the sand. The weather channel on my handheld radio was declaring measured wind speeds of 25 to 35 knots and gusts up to 45. I'd argue it was slightly higher, but to be fair, every wind is 35 knots when you're rigging up a tarp. Once I had a semblance of order, I cooked a hot meal filled with habaneros and jalapenos. I packed a wool base layer as part of my emergency kit, and I had it on, plus almost every other item of clothing in my supplies. It was cold, but as long as I stayed dry, I was safe from hypothermia. Well, the rain has started here at Camp Windburn. We got nothing but all the finest things in life, the finest wind. The finest rain, the finest things getting soaked in the rain. And there you have it. I had it in my head that the fastest, most expeditious way out of the predicament I was in, stranded for the duration of a storm in a crappy location, was to portage Mano Iki Iki across the dunes to the marsh side of the spit and make my escape on the next high tide. At dusk, I undid the lashings holding the yakas to the wa'a and carried the amas and akas across the dunes, stopping every so often to give my sore back and chafed skin a break. I was beginning to suffer from all the timbers I'd scavenged that day. I then went back and dragged the canoe across the dunes, at first using crab trap floats I found in the tide line as rollers until that proved untenable in the light sand. Then I just dragged the narrow canoe across the sand. I left Mano Iki Iki next to a mud hole in pieces, confident he'd be there in the morning. At one point during that second night, my imagination led me to believe the sapling trunk I'd propped up with the bamboo to form the frame of the windbreak could slide across the sand and drop the sapling on my head. Last night in the middle of the night, I started thinking that... Oh, look at sand. I started thinking about the way the wind was blowing on this. And I came in and I added these shock cords and then these lines here running back because the wind pushing right there could push the whole tripod over so I started I was laying in bed thinking about that got fairly nervous about it and then I added that stuff last night got out of bed and did it which is otherwise I wouldn't go to sleep at 0700, Fleetwood called. He had been monitoring the weather situation, and he and Bill, both having spent years working as salvers, picking bones off the carcasses of dead boats who had met similar weather, were of a mind to come out and snatch me off the island. Offshore seas were 32 feet with up to 60 knot winds. I was content to wait it out and continue on with the trip that I intended. The storm front was stalled, but the forecasts at that point were still confidently declaring the winds would die down to something reasonable. What I believed I most needed was a drill so I could fix my broken wa'a and escape that damnable spot. This is how we fix the boat, fix the boat, fix the boat. So here's a repair. I drilled the hole through and I ran that Dyneema line. Uh, Dyneema is um, stronger than a cable of equivalent uh, diameter. So I ran that uh, Dyneema and on the inside I twisted it in here. It's called a Spanish windlass. I just twist it, I stick it in between and I twist it until it tightens it incredibly tight. And then I just lashed this in place. Uh, around here, so it maintains that constant tension. The, um, as you can see, that's as tight as you're gonna get. It's starting to pull it into the actual wood itself. So, a fair, uh, repairs are now effected, and I will start putting the boat back together for the high tide. With the repair completed, I went back to the tent to make coffee, and that's when I noticed that the area one dune north of me and the area one dune south of me had both been overrun by breakers while I slept the night before. Another indication of how lucky I am, you can see where the tide broached, uh, came over these um, sand dunes, poured in, you can see where it poured in here, poured in right around to here, 
it's all full of water last night. That's where the tent is. There's literally that little rise there. Where the tent is sitting is lower than this. That little rise is maybe a two inch, three inch. That's it. Same thing back behind. Uh, you can see that line of water right there where it came in. It came in and even hit my, my wind stakes. I reassessed everything right there on the spot. That spot being a very not good location. I had to move. Should I make it a lateral move and carry all my crap up the beach a quarter of a mile to the tallest dune that sported a lone palm tree in a tangle of beach briar? Or should I load up the boat and escape across the marsh as I had planned? I went with escape across the marsh, which meant I had to move, and I had to move right then. I had no time to spare. The tide was three quarters in. I did the fastest camp breakdown, gear pack up, and cargo loading imaginable, and without a single look back, I shoved off. A nearby hammock looked inviting. It was to windward. I pointed my bow to windward and paddled like mad and was immediately blown south by the 35 knot north wind and into the thickest tangles of marsh grass I was trying to avoid. What followed was a half hour of curses, frustrations, and inconsolable angst towards a mercilessly unfavorable situation until I broke out onto a small creek with a false sense of relief. In just a few short minutes, my five to seven knot speed brought me to the mouth of a creek where it dumped into Little Tybee Creek. On impulse and with an adrenaline-fueled sense of self-preservation, I drove Mano Iki Iki up onto a raft of dead marsh grass at seven knots just before being swept out into the Atlantic. Well, here I sit, um, the wind at my back. You can't really tell uh, the wind direction here, but over here is the main channel and right there is the Atlantic Ocean and the current is flowing out in that direction at a breakneck speed and the wind is blowing in that direction at uh, 20, 25 knots with gusts up to 35 knots. I just came from this direction. I got around here. I do not want to go out into the Atlantic Ocean. Eating slices from a salami, alternating bites with a hunk of gouda, I pondered the many different ways my next move could go wrong. Capsize, swept into the breakers and broken, swept into the breakers and broached, the wreckage piling up on Wausau's northern shore. Gradually, a sizable sandbar at the mouth of the creek, noted only as changeable area on my charts, was revealed by the dropping water level. I backed Manuiki Iki out of the marsh where we'd waited and moved to the roomier real estate of the sandbar and scoped out Little Tybee Creek, or as much of it as I could see. When I was convinced the current's velocity had dropped and the ebb tide had last arrived, I braved the crossing with only the confoundingly relentless winds to contend. And here's the crux of the matter. Right there is the Atlantic Ocean. Right there is where I want to be. If I miss... Uh, I'm toast. The current's running that way, the wind is blowing that way. It was an almost placid crossing, only marred by my lingering misgivings. Beach Hammock is an elderly dune covered in palm trees, palmettos, live oaks, dune briars, cactus, yucca, and is surrounded by three distinct types of marsh habitat, all of which mark the land's rising elevation where I landed. Little Tybee Creek runs parallel to Beach Hammock, and a line of dunes forms the south bank of the creek and bounds the marshes on that side of the hammock. I opted to pitch camp on the dunes so I didn't have to haul gear through the marsh to the dense woods of the island proper. It also allowed me to tend to Manuiki Iki as the tidewater began to flow. I was exhausted, and once camp was set, the required windbreak constructed firstly, all I wanted to do was sleep. I set an alarm on my phone and tried to sleep, but my nagging mind forced me out to check on the ever-changing state of things again and again. Here is a question. This is water. The tide's coming in. Here's the edge of the water. My question is, how good do I feel? <laughs> Holy crap, that's close. Over here, the boat is now up on the heart and the lapping water is right here. So 
I acted before the first of the waves breached the dune on the creek side. I moved the tent to the highest available spot, a sand spur infested tangle crowned with dead marsh grass about the same size as the tent. My biggest fear about moving the tent was that the wind would take it and the thermarest and sleeping bag still inside of it and hurl them one and all into the Atlantic because the wind was blowing a solid 40 knots. At midnight, the tide was still coming in. I continued to drag Mano Iki Iki away from the eroding shore as the sand washed out from underneath them, waves pouring over the sands and rejoining the water in the marsh. I made my last stand by the tent. I put the dry suit bag next to the fly opening on top of my sandals and watched as the last of the dry land around me disappeared under the rising water. Waves washed the dune from under Mano Iki Iki's bow, and he rocked back and forth as the waves smacked his long, narrow hull. Only his stern remained on a dry lump of grass-covered dune, now a lonely little islet. Around me was a wind-ravaged tempest. White horses raged to the east. A forty-knot sustained blow howled out of the inundated marshes to the north. Two hundred yards of black, creeping water stood between me and the trees of the inhospitable tangles to my west. This is, uh, this is no fun. This is literally no fun. And isolated and beset dune peaks were caught between the hammer and anvil where the still and rolling waters met and pulled them under, inch by inexorable inch, to my south. My planned next and final step was to put the dry suit back on, climb into the drowned tent, and wait until dawn. But the tide finally stopped at midnight 20, almost an hour and a half after the predicted high. So I climbed into the tent at long last, and I discovered every single sand spur under the tent floor with my hands and knees as I worked my way into my sleeping bag. I fell asleep on a giant hump in a sideways incline, the sleeping bag slipping off the thermarest pad like it was greased. And I actually slept a little until it started to rain, which was also not predicted. The rain fly no longer worked. The wind had ripped out all the tent stakes and the entire rig was flogging around like a tube man at a used car lot. The rainwater soaked from the rain fly to the tent fabric with no resistance and I woke up to the inside of the wet tent slapping my face over and over. At dawn, I saw to what extent the changes to the landscape had been wrought by the night's king tide. Four feet of the shore dunes along the creek had disappeared. Dead marsh grass had moved. In a landscape that never ceases to change, it was nothing. Just an unforecasted king tide. Move along, you tired and filthy little monkey. There's nothing to see here. So what if a few thousand tons of sand moved? Mother Nature on the Gullah Coast is cold and merciless and takes care of her own affairs, and my fate is all my own. I feed the crabs, or the crabs feed me. The end. Fleetwood showed up on the incoming tide in his aluminum-hulled powerboat to tow me back to Tybee through the cut that joins Little Tybee Creek to the back river, a narrow little cut that Laura and I hauled a John boat through by hand one low tide back in 2011. A little bit of sun was up and the wind dropped to 20 knots, but it was still blowing and the margin for error were still fairly close to zero. Mano Iki Iki wasn't a fan of being towed and although Fleetwood had just made a tow bar for his boat, which he'd previously joked was for towing me back to his dock when I got my ass kicked, it wasn't installed, and I had to tend the line the entire slow go back. Back at the boat shed, the sun was out, and the wind was blocked by the entirety of the island tree canopy. It was a nice spring day, exactly the kind of day I envisioned when planning this adventure. A lizard had ridden the entire ride from dock to beach hammock and back again on the outboard steering cable. I scooped him up and delivered him to a dry, bug-infested water oak, a kindred spirit. The trip I'd imagined taking down the coast? It was, for the time being, over. Once I was back in safe harbors and recovered from my sleep deficit of the previous week, further testing with Mano Iki Iki resumed, this time with some feedback from Fleetwood. When I put my home-built electric thruster to an endurance test, he went out in his white hall with a manufactured electric motor, and I got a good apples-to-apples -apples comparison. This is my test of the electric outboard. This is the battery. We are making way a little bit. I got the wind and the current in my teeth. 
one of the reasons for this test this way. So, kind of funny. Um, that's kicking out around two and a half amps at 45 volts, I think. And I've got the current and the wind against me. Not the wind we had the other day, but definitely a wind. So, so far so good. We're gonna do this test and see how far I can get before the battery dies. Fleetwood is coming up behind me in a, a fiberglass white hall with a mint coda. So he, he might catch me. That thing might be faster than this. So, um, but so far so good. We're definitely making way. Not a lot, but enough. I then went out for a sail on a blustery 10 to 12 knot day while he followed in his V-bottom powerboat and took photos and examined the hull characteristics of Manoiki Iki. Between us we determined. The flat stem is too wet, so I should add a piece of nosing to trim it out. The center of effort isn't where I estimated it to be, and as a consequence I should move the drop leeboard aft several feet. The curved akas look great, but are impractical, and flatter akas would enable me to move about and distribute my weight where it is needed much more simply. The yama has the minimum amount of flotation, and an increase in volume would also help provide for using my body as weight distribution. I packed Mano Iki Iki back onto the truck, said my farewells, and in part retraced my steps, first by overnighting in Brunswick at my brother's place, then by heading west. I avoided Atlanta, avoided bad weather, and it wasn't until New Mexico that a massive headwind prevented me from being able to do the speed limit. So I wandered off the beaten path earlier than intended and stumbled across the wonderful little town of Madrid, New Mexico. In Durango, I stopped to see one of my favorite people, artist, weaver, clockwork aficionado, and parakeet whisperer, Meg. I was treated to a fantastic tour of the full collection at the Center of Southwest Studies where her daughter, Gretchen, is an archivist. The visit was far, far too short. I took off for Meg's late in the afternoon over to Moab to see my free-spirited tarot-reading gypsy friend Ivy, who hand-stitched much of Manuiki Iki's mainsail. Her directions led me into the desert over boulders my two-wheel drive truck should have probably avoided, where I slept in the truck bed under a sky full of three-dimensional stars. I drove back out of the desert at 0600 the long way, and a day and a half later, I was home. I didn't get the voyage I wanted. I didn't get the voyage I expected. Hell, I didn't even get the voyage I needed. But I took a trip that I certainly won't forget. I'm not fully satisfied with that, however. I want to explore the Georgia coast much more fully, and I want to do it how I want to do it. So, in this next year, I hope to make alterations to Mano Iki Iki that I think will make my next attempt more likely to be successful. Flatter, longer akas, a bigger ama, and the solar inboard much more integral to the boat for those times I need a little more oomph. And next year, I plan to actually sail the Gullah Coast, weather permitting, of course. Until then, hopefully, I'll stay sand free.